Hello everyone. I am so excited to be chatting with Steve Winter. Um, he is one of my heroes in, in conservation photography um, and I'm so excited for him to join. Happy holidays everybody and I'm here on behalf of, hi Amit, I'm here on behalf of Vital Impacts, which is this nonprofit that Eileen Mignoni and I have started to, um, to raise money for conservation, for mentoring. Um, we've also established a couple of $20,000 grants. So any photographers that are interested in you know, conservation, environmental storytelling, please apply for those and we have a mentoring program and um, so many exciting things coming this year. And I am just waiting for Steve. I might just see if I can find him um, and just give me one second. But photography really is the most powerful medium in that we can do so much to create change. Here, here he is, he turned on. Steve, you're here. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> so good to see you. Happy holidays. Yeah. So, um, Steve, let's dive right in because, you know, uh, you're one of the photographers that I have admired for my whole career, not just because of the, you know, the, the images are beautiful and meaningful, but you are one of those people that, advocates for change and you've had tremendous impact in the work that you've done and I thought maybe we can start on a you know I know it's been a really difficult week for you but maybe you can just start by telling the story of P22 and and how you got to know him well thanks Amy and hi everybody happy holidays everything but you know P22 is quite the story uh, I was working on the first wild cougar story for National Geographic, and I went to a mountain lion meeting in Bozeman, Montana, to meet a uh, scientist that's working with the LA cougar. Right north of LA, uh, there is a uh, the largest urban park in the United States, the Santa Monica National Recreation Area. So I went to the meeting to meet Jeff Sickich, who's the guy that captures and collars the cougars there for the scientific project that the Park Service is doing. So I went there and asked him a very specific question. Do you have any trails where cougars walk, where you could see the lights of LA in the background so we could illustrate urban wildlife? You know, I start asking him all these questions and, and he goes, you do realize, you know, we're right by Hollywood. And every answer to the question was no, no, no. So I gave you my information and said, well, if, you know, if anything changes, let me know. But I said, you know, what would really tell the story of urban wildlife is if we could get a picture of a mountain lion with the Hollywood sign. And he looked at me like I was crazy and said, there are no cat <laughs> cougars in Griffith Park. But when I was a kid, my grandma took me on pony rides at the LA Zoo. And for some reason, in the back of my head, I remember there being a cougar there. So I just said, Jeff, yeah, I'll come down and see you and check it all out. And I did, I went to LA and I saw the yes, there were no trails where you could see the lights of LA in the background. But guess what, eight months later, I get a text that says, in all caps, call me now with like 10 exclamation points. <laughs> and he goes, Steve, you're not going to believe this, but we just got a trail cam picture of a cougar in Griffith Park right across from the Hollywood Bowl. And it's one of the most amazing stories. You know, number one, that I had that thought in my mind and visualized the picture, but that P-22, which was his name, crossed two of the busiest freeways in the United States, if not the world, and walked into Griffith Park, and everything changed. Now, 
for me, I had to figure out how I could put these remote cameras in a park with 24 million visitors a year without them getting stolen. And we did. And after 11 months, I got the picture of the cat standing there with all the lights of LA in the background. And the LA Times put it on the cover of the newspaper to advertise the 125th anniversary of National Geographic because the show was at the Annenberg Space for Photography. And then after 15 months, I got right there, there P22 and the Hollywood sign. Can you move your head so everybody can just see it for a second? That just, I'm sure, yeah. Picture in my living room here. Wow. And that, that was incredible. Um, it was a difficult place to find without the help of Jeff Sickich, that biologist. I would have never got this picture nor any of the others because Jeff came in every three weeks to monitor P-22 with the antenna, even though he had GPS points all during the light hours. You know, I just want to stop on that for a second. Like, you know, that, that movie, it's like, if, if you build it, they will come. I mean, you had this idea in your head that was so fantastical. Like, nobody would imagine it was really real. And I love that you, 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 you know, I think that that's a really good metaphor for photographers to, you know, even if something seems so ridiculous and crazy and impossible, it's patience, like you had the patience, you had the dream, first of all, and the patience. And I mean, I just love this story for so many reasons. And then, but then what happened, because you, this image has had such impact. I mean, this is what I love about you and your work. Because can you talk about what's happened because of this one image? Well, definitely, um, number one, P-22 is, was a miracle cat. You know, the fact that he would do this, and we have to realize why. P-22 was a young cat, a little over a year old, maybe a year and a half. His father was the alpha male in the Santa Monica National Recreation Area, which is right north of Sunset, south of Oxnard, east of Malibu, and west of the 101. So the largest urban park in the United States. He had to find his own territory or he was gonna to have to fight his dad. Now, Jeff said he was the biggest cat he'd ever collared at that time, uh, but he wanted to get out and there was a natural way for him to walk a corridor that ended in Griffith Park. So he went over those freeways and everything and he just, he was a miracle cat. And then that was a miracle image because uh, you're right. I never gave up. Jeff never gave up till he found that spot right there. This is the spot with all the black behind. It's a four second exposure. The flashes went off. E22 kept walking and then the shutter was open for four seconds to light, you know, expose the Hollywood sign and the sky because the Hollywood sign hasn't been lit since like what 1928 or 29 when it said Hollywood land advertising the homes that are now the Hollywood Hills but P22 has been part of a scientific project you know he uh, the Angelinos fell in love with him he was an international celebrity in the land of celebrities and <laughs> that line. Oh my God! Yes. Now like, he could coexist with predators, and that wildlife are our, our neighbors, and people they had hope because everybody that wants to walk at the end of the day in Griffith Park, their dogs, or just take a walk or ride their mountain bike or whatever, they want to get away from the noise and the cement, get dirt under their feet, hear some birds sing. And knowing that they had a mountain lion there was just incredible to everybody. And it brought the community together. 
they started talking about the need for wildlife overpasses, for wildlife mm -hmm. corridors. It started to be taught in all LA school districts, wildlife of LA. Most people don't know this, but LA is the most biodiverse city in North America and one of the most biodiverse cities in the world. Because if you stand up by the Hollywood sign and look north or east, you're seeing mountains. You know, it's just absolutely incredible and open space. Uh, so they do have wildlife and they do have a healthy population of cougars, but they're inbred, just like the Florida panther was before they brought a cat over from Texas. So uh, lo and behold, here is the California director of the National Wildlife Federation, Beth Pratt. And Beth is, you know, you talk about never giving up, that is Beth. She had this idea for a wildlife overpass, found the architects, never gave up, spent a decade fundraising, and it ended up being the $88 million Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Overpass. And this image was a spark and it helped, but Beth never gave up. And thank you to all the people in LA that have donated, that have expanded their mind to understand that you need overpasses. I just heard her on KTLA talking about there needs to be one at Griffith Park. There's an area on the 405 where seven mountain lions have died trying to cross the 405 in the same location. So P22's legacy is going to be all that happens because of him more corridors, more overpasses. And you know, I, I, I know this is very simple, but I know we have a large audience. Um, and can you just explain to people, describe what those highways are like and what a wildlife overpass is for anybody that might not know? Well, what it is, is, you know, the 101 where they're putting it is state land on one side, federally protected on the other. So it's all open land. And they're building this great expansive corridor. You can find it online, Wallace Amberg Wildlife Over. Got to be dedicated to P22. Um, but it spreads out so people and animals can walk up over the 101 down to the other side. It actually covers the frontage road there in Agora Hills. It's called the Gore Road. So it's actually going over 10 lanes of the 101 and then over the frontage road and that it follows the 101. And yeah. it's a beautiful area that when you walk onto it, you won't actually know. And then all of a sudden you walk up and you're standing right above the 101 freeway. And you can go on Save LA Cougars and see this uh, live camera. It'll be there until its completion in 2025. Because it's amazing undertaking. That's why it's the largest wildlife over the world. Uh, it's incredible. And somebody was just asking questions. I think some people, I just want to visualize it for them. They're saying, why, does it, why don't people just stop in traffic? Well, you have to imagine there's millions of people living in LA and it's like, I don't know, 12 lanes of traffic right. and there's cement corridors. And it's really, there's no, it's, I mean, it would be a miracle for any animal to actually survive crossing right. that much traffic. And people are going fast and they can't, you know, it would cause traffic accidents if people stop. So I think that, you know, this is just, sorry to just visualize it for people who may not know LA. Um, this corridor, it's massive, and it basically is like a bridge over the highway with grass, and it looks like the wild, and so animals like can a, go back. But a, a bridge that looks like nature, there will be trees and bushes and all this. But, but no way, well, once a cat would get down there, the problem mm -hmm. was they had one cat that made it across, and then he ran into this high cement wall and there's cars whizzing past him, you know, 24 hours a day. And then he came across again and got hit. And with the wildlife overpass, they can go all the way to San Jose. 
That's crazy. I mean, that, and for people that don't know California, can you give a sense of like how many miles or kilometers that would be? From LA to San Jose, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I know it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of habitat for the animals to be able to roam. Yeah, so it's, it's incredible. There's no way that all the free there are full. No matter if you come at twelve o'clock midnight, two o'clock in the morning, there's less. That's when the cats would want to move. But now they have a safe way to do it, and so that is confused. Like and that's. That's because of your image, and I just want to give a shout out to to the fact that um, your image is for sale on vitalimpacts.org. I put the link in. I'll put it again. You can purchase this print, and the proceeds are going to go to Big Life uh, Voices, and um, that is Steve's nonprofit that is helping big cats all over the world, right? Right, and it's helping media projects so we can end up uh, having a, a final result on it, like the overpass, like the Thai tiger tail, uh, like yes. tigers. On December 20th, the last story I did with my longtime partner, Sharon Gaina, who's also a writer for National Geographic, we did the all why there's more captive tigers in the U.S. than there are in the wild that came out a 30-page story in the December 2019 National Geographic, four months before Tiger King came out. And all the people that worked on the Hill to try to push through the Big Cat Public Safety Act said the House and Senators said they were very moved by the story in National Geographic because National Geographic gave every member of Congress a copy of that issue. Brilliant. And I on September 20th. So how many days ago? Three days ago, it was signed into law. So we want to do stories that have tangible results. And that's what's important to us. I mean, and that's what I think really differentiates you from so, you know, there's so many amazing photographers out there. But what I love about you and your work is this, like, literally, I wanted to talk about some of the other stories you've done. And it's not just the story that shocks people or, you know, or they're like, wow, that's a beautiful photo. But then you go so far to make sure that the, the issues that you're covering that they're changed and that there's impact. And so I wanted to go back in history a little bit and have you, maybe we can start with the temple in Thailand and what your work from there did. Can you tell us a little about that? When I was doing the last tiger story, I wanted to do some of the subspecies that were threatened. So I did the Sumatran tiger, and then I did the Indo-Chinese tiger and worked with the Thai tiger in Thailand. And I asked him about a place I kept hearing about, and Sharon told me about it. And it was the Thai Tiger Temple, where it was a tourist attraction, where you could go pet tiger cubs and bottle feed tiger cubs 365 days a year. And the scientist said, Steve, don't go there. We think they're involved in the black market trade in tigers. It was like, well, hold it. Number one, don't go there. I'm going to go. And if they're in the, involved in the black market trade, but you're like, we can't do anything because they're monks. Well, guess what? I'm not Thai. I'm going there, and we're going to see what we can do. So we had a picture that ran, and then 18 months later, Sharon was contacted by a Australian NGO, Sea for Life, and she had uh, two people that used to work there, the vet and the lawyer, and they wanted to give evidence. So her and Sharon started an investigation. I came over to do the video. And then we, it ran on National Geographic. Then it ran on all Thai media, seven and a half minute video I did. They took off the Nat Geo site, they ran it. Sharon wrote four stories. After the fourth story, the government came in with the army and police, confiscated 178 tigers, there was 25 tigers on meat hooks hanging in the freezer and 20 cubs in jars. So if it sounds bad, guess what? It is. And if you're going to breed tigers 365 days a year so you can have cubs for cub petting and bottle feeding, guess what? You're not going to always have 150 tigers, which was their blanket answer. 
we have 150 tigers. No, you couldn't because you're breeding 365 days a year for your tourism operation that brings in millions of dollars a year. So that was a, an example of where if it sounds bad, guess what? It is bad. But this started on my first story when I did the f first big cat story. I did the first jaguar story and went down to Brazil and where all the cowboys were killing jaguars because they said the only good jaguar was a dead jaguar because all cattle deaths they said could be attributed to jaguars. Now, commonsensically, that is ridiculous. So luckily the scientist I was working with, her boss was my best friend, the late Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. So I got Alan to do the first ever GPS sat college story on cats. And we found out in the end, only 1% of cattle deaths could be attributed to jaguars. And that saved things. And then in 2017, one of the Panthera scientists, I spent four years at Panthera, he did a, his PhD project, his dissertation, and found that each cow is only worth $2,000 in its lifetime. Each jaguar now with all the ecotourism coming in brings in $108,000 every year. So economically, it's important. So those jaguars are protected there. So that was important. Then the U.S. Tiger story. We did that, spent two years doing the investigation, you know, with uh, being around the likes of uh, Joe Exotic, uh, Doc Antle. I spent nine days with him. And uh, Jeff, uh, all the people that are now under federal and state indictment for money laundering, wildlife trafficking, wildlife abuse, they're all under um, state or federal indictment. And now they signed the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And so it's something to feel good about. Like that first Jaguar story, I came from UNICEF and it's like, you're, you, you don't watch kids die, you're there to help them live better lives. And I'm not going to spend two years on a story just to walk away and know the cowboys are still going to kill those cats. No, I'm not gonna. We can find a way to make a better life for the animals that we work with. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, even with P22, I think a lot of people living in urban places might be terrified knowing that they have, you know, a puma in their backyard. And, um, and you, I think the way you tell your stories, the, these visual stories, it really makes people understand um, that we can coexist. And can you speak about that a little bit? I mean, is that a conscious thing in the way you, you, you work? Well, and, and 100%, I think it was so important when um, uh, the former director of photography, Sarah Lean, let that picture I, I got, the first picture of P22, be on the cover of the LA Times. Now, obviously, there was a storm of interest in this, but not all of it was positive till Jeff Sickich and his boss, Seth Riley, got on every local TV station to explain that these are ghost cats. They have no desire to see us. And in the first eight years P-22 lived there, only a handful of people saw him, except when he went in the crawl space under somebody's house. And uh, that was that was by accident. But listen, a handful of people means less than 10 in eight years. And once people knew that and they were walking, instead they were so proud to be walking those trails. Every time I would leave the park at night, I would go see a P-22 and it was pr probably around midnight or one in the morning because I had to work part of the night to check the lights, be sure that everything was working on my video and still cameras. But, you know, in the end, people understood that and they rallied around P-22. And now LA's got P-22 Day every Octo October 20th. Oh my God, I love that. That's amazing. How does that feel? I actually want to, you know, it's a funny thing <laughs> that you've actually never seen this cat. You just saw this cat through your pictures. And can you talk about that and your relationship with this animal that you only knew through your photographs? 
Well, right in the beginning, Jeff goes, uh, we put a really, we don't have any GPS sat collar study. I mean, collar left. And I said, you know what? I have a grant from the National Geographic Society. Let me put in for another grant. But right now, let me help you out because you're going to help me out to get these pictures and monitor my cameras and everything that um, um, uh, let me buy some collars. So I bought three collars, $5,000 each, $15,000. So I never saw him, but P22 was wearing a collar that was for by National Geographic. So to me, that was important because I didn't really think about it much. When Jeff, I, he said, as soon as I'm going to collar him, I'll let you know. But he was driving one time with the radio. The antenna stuck out of his passenger window, and all of a sudden he got a beep, 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 which means he's right there. He walked out, saw him, got his blowgun, put a tranquilizer dot in it, walked up to him. P-22 goes, and he darted him. He went to sleep and he put a brand new collar on it that was bought by National Geographic Grant. So I that made me feel good. But I never really thought about whether I was going to see him or not. I just was thank, so thankful that he walked in front of my camera so many times. And he walked in front of this right here because this is what was important because I knew to rally around people in this area. Everybody loves big cats and everybody loves Hollywood. And he's such a celebrity. I mean, people are saying he should have his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And he definitely needs to have a statue in Griffith Park celebrating P-22. And you never know, someday there could be another, another cougar that follows that same pathway as we did in a helicopter. We took all the doors off and followed the way he would go with uh, my assistant then, Drew Rush, and Jeff Sickich from the National Park Service. And, you know, it, 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 the corridor of the walkway ends right before the Hollywood Bowl. You go across this bridge and you're right there. So it's really incredible. I mean, Steve, I know it has to be such an emotional week for you. And I so grateful for you know all of the advocacy that you do and i know it's it's got to be really hard well i th think in the end that you know the tears come and they keep coming but then i always turn positive in the end because he has a legacy that will live decades but forever you know, people are never going to forget about P-22 because he was the miracle cat. He made it to Griffith Park and spent a decade there. In the beginning, when he first got there, you know, some of the scientists were worried. Well, every time he goes, to, you know, down to the five, we're going to wonder whether he wants to cross because the last cougar died in 2006. Then and he tried to cross uh, the five and was hit by a car. But P-22 stayed there without a mate until about 18 months ago. And he started to go into Los Feliz and uh, Silver Lake area. And uh, then, unfortunately, he was hit by a car. But his legacy is going to be that his cousins and brothers and sisters and uh, all of his relatives are going to be able to pass over roads much easier with these wildlife bridges or overpasses and underpasses in the future because of the legacy of p22 well i i mean and that was your brilliance to even imagine this uh this image Impossible. That, that's, and I just, you know, I, I, I just want to kind of end by saying, you know, please, if anybody is interested, this is such a unique opportunity to have this beautiful image that hopefully will inspire you 
and know that it's giving back too. And I mean, that is why we all do. I think so many of us are motivated by the impacts that we can really have with images. I think photography is this unique language that, um, that transcends all borders. Everybody understands what these images mean. And, um, and thank you. Thank you for taking time in the middle of this holiday season and for all everything that you do. Oh, you're so welcome, Amy, and same to you because you do so, so much good. But I just want to reiterate, this shows the power of photography. I mean, once this came out, the first one rallied people, but once they saw, there's a mound line under the Hollywood sign. <laughs> You know, once that happened and that was published in the 20, uh, in the December issue uh, of that Cougar story, P, it was just amazing the amount of support that happened. And P22, you will live forever and you'll influence policy and wildlife policy for. Thank you, Amy. Happy holidays to everybody. And thanks for joining us today and thanks for having me and having the print of p22 on vital impacts what an honor oh it, it is our privilege and honor too and um just yes all of you thank you for tuning in and um and follow steve's nonprofit, which is bigcatvoices.org and um and then oh one more shout out if anybody's interested, we are, we've just announced two $20,000 grants and a mentoring program at vitalimpacts.org. And it has to be a project, a long-term project based, um, you know, in your backyard, and it must be about an environmental or conservation issue. But that's all. Have a happy holiday. Lots of love, Steve. Thank you so much. Love back and hugs. Thanks, Amy. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.